Inshallah, tonight is a continuation of the story uh, that we are discussing under the opening verses of Surah Al Buruj. Surah Al Buruj is the 85th surah of the glorious Quran. And the title of the story is The, the Boy and the King. Uh, now, I don't think so, it will be befitting if we. Uh, commence the story from the start so it is for my noble audience to recollect what we have discussed in the last two lessons in relation to that story uh, we were two thirds through the story and inshallah tonight by the grace of Allah Almighty we will complete the story so basically we made mention that uh, uh, the king came to know that uh, the boy has become a believer. And he found out who were responsible for his spiritual education. So the monk was murdered. The courtier, the blind person that accepted, he was slaughtered as well. So now the boy, whose name was Abdullah bin Tamir, was standing in front of the king and the king decided that he should be slaughtered as well. He should be executed because he has given up the religion of the town. So Abdullah bin Tamir was sent off with a group of soldiers to the top of a mountain. And I think that's where we stopped. So we'll continue from that. I'm going to read from the book. So the soldiers took the boy to the top of the mountain. They ascended the mountain until they reached the top. And they gave him an option to turn apostate, to denounce the faith. If he does not denounce the faith, they will throw him from the top of the mountain. Now what happened is that when the child reached the top, and he was given this option to give up faith, he said, Oh Allah, save me from them by anything you wish. Because Allah Almighty can save a person in a style that he desires. So the style was not stipulated. The style was not stipulated by the boy. Allah is Almighty. Oh Allah, you save me as you will. So the mountain shook and all of the soldiers fell from above. Now, the shaking of the mountain had a very profound impact upon the soldiers and they started to drop from the top. But that boy remained very, very firm. So now what happened is the boy was alone. Now he had a agenda because he could have escaped from there. He could have run away. But he went back to the king. Because he had a master plan. And he was working towards that master plan. So the question may come to your mind, why didn't he run away? There was no soldier there. But he had a master plan. So the boy came back walking to the king. The king asked him, what did your companions do? The boy said, Allah has saved me from them. The king then ordered some of his courtiers to take the boy on a board, on board a boat, into the middle of the sea, saying that if he turns apostate, fine, well, otherwise cast him into the sea. So they took him and the boat capsized. So all those that were on board, excluding the boy, drowned. And this boy once again was saved by Allah Almighty. Now he had the second chance to run away, but he's working towards the master plan. So without anyone forcing him, he returns back to the king. So the king said, what happened this time? He replied, Allah saved me from them. And he further said to the king, you cannot kill me. He said that I have been informed through divine channel that you cannot kill me and you are trying to kill me that's why you took me to the top of the mountain and you placed me in the boat but this is not going to work so you cannot kill me 
until you do that which I tell you to do. The king saying, what is that? So the king said, all right, you tell me, what should I do to kill you? The boy said, gather all the people in an upland place. So like on a high platform, high area. So those that are on lower ground can see what is to unfold. So take me to the upland place and fasten me over the stem of a tree. So tie me to the trunk of a tree. Then take an arrow from my quiver and fix it in the bow and say in the name of Allah, the Lord of the boy. In the name of Allah, which Allah, the Lord of the boy and shoot at me. So you have to gather the entire town. I have to be tied to the stem of a tree. Everyone has to be observing. And then you take the arrow from my quiver and you shoot it. But before shooting it, you have to shout out in the name of the Lord of this boy. Now this was the uh, da'wah that the boy wanted to give to the entire community. Now, before this episode, you should remember that certain karamat, miracles, were displayed by him. So his miracles had become the talk of the town. But the people, most of them were not educated that how these miracles took place. Because witchcraft and sorcery was rampant. So many, many people still were confused. And they thought that these miracles, unusual acts that are being displayed by these boys, are attributed to the old sorcerer. It is his education. So this was going to be a, a great event. And everyone in the town was to be a witness. So he made it very clear that when you shoot me, you make mention of Allah, the Lord of this boy. So everyone will know that the death basically is by the creator by the might and the order of Allah Almighty if you do that you will kill me so the king gathered the people in an upland place and fastened the boy over the stem took an arrow from his quiver fixed it in the bow and said in the name of Allah the Lord of the boy and shot the arrow the arrow hit over the temporal region okay temporal region and that's why even uh, in boxing, there are two weak points of a boxer. Temporal region and the chin. So this is where you, especially the chin, this is where you lose the balance. So that's why in boxing they say he's got a good chin, he's got a weak chin. And this area too, a person loses the balance. So the temporal region of the skull of the boy and the boy put his hand over the temporal region of the skull at the point where the arrow hit and then died. So basically uh, when the arrow struck him at this point, he placed his hand over his uh, skull and he died in that position. The people proclaimed, we have believed in the Lord of the boy. We have believed in the Lord of the boy. So they say, Amantu, we have believed in the rub of this child. The king came and it was said to him that this is the thing which you were afraid of. You murdered one, the courtier, the blind courtier. Then you murdered the monk and now you murdered this child and you try to suppress the message. But this program that was designed by the child basically has made all your fear come to reality everyone has accepted now what happened that is the thing which you are afraid of by Allah the thing which you are afraid of has fallen upon you the people have believed in Allah so he ordered for deep ditches deep deep trenches ditches to be dug at the entrances of the roads so there was no exit point. So all the exit points basically had ditches. Now, I can relate to this because uh, uh, in Pakistan and people that are from Pakistan, they will understand this. We have many, many gates. Huh? Dili Darwaza, Lahori Gate. So basically the city was surrounded by gates. I saw this in Dilhi as well when I went to Nizamuddin. That there are certain areas that they have many, many gates. 
So what this person did is that these gates through which people used to enter and exit, he made ditches there. So no one could run and no one could escape. And they were very deep. And then what he did is, then he placed a fire in it and he uh, kindled it uh, in those ditches. So there was a very strong flame and fire in those ditches. And the king ordered that whoever did not turn apostate be cast into the ditches. So basically about 70,000 people were thrown into the ditches. And it was done. Then there came a woman with her baby. She nearly retreated back. So she was holding her baby. And basically sometimes it's easy to give your life, but it is very hard to give your child's life up. So sometimes people say, you can take my life, but don't harm uh, my child. So she had this baby, and she knew that if she did not denounce the faith, she will be thrown into the flames of that fire, and the child will be thrown. So basically, when the child against the norm spoke, so that child spoke and said, Mom, don't worry about it. Isbiri, isbiri. Ya Ummi Isbiri, innaki ala al-haqq. O mother, be very, very patient. You are on the right path. So even if you are going to be thrown into the fire, do not denounce. Now, the theologians and the scholars have made mention that before the body made it into the fire, the souls were extracted. So the body experiences pain when it has a connection with the soul. So Allah Almighty allowed the bodies to be thrown into that uh, kindled fire, that intense fire. But before the body used to touch the fire, the soul used to be extracted. And that's why the child said, Ya Ummi, O my mother, Isbiri, be very, very patient. Allah is on our side. Innaki ala al-haq. Uh, you are on the right path. Don't give up your faith. So she threw herself in the ditch of the fire along with her child to be with the martyrs in paradise. Now this entire story that we have just completed is from Sahih Muslim. I made mention two weeks ago that the Muslim with a few changes has been made mention by Imam Tirmazi as well and Imam Tabarani has made mention as well. Now I'd like to make mention of uh, a point that Imam Tirmazi has recorded in Tirmazi and the great Mufassir Tafsir Mazhari has made mention of this as well. Now you need to listen attentively, undivided attention so you can follow. I'm going to ask you a question so I will know that how much you have sustained the knowledge. This event took place when? 70 years before Nabi Akrim was born. And where did it take place? In Yemen. So Yemen is not too far away from, uh, from Makkah and Medina. So 70 years before Nabi Akrim was born, this event where ditches were dug out and fire was placed in it and then believers were thrown into it 70 years before. So Nabi Akrim arrived, 70 years have lapsed, passed. How many years did the Prophet of Allah live for? 63. So you add 63 to 70, how many years is that now? 113, is it? 113, I take your word. So let's say 63 and 70, I don't think so, it's right, but... Huh? 133. 133, I thought so. So 133, so 63 and 70 is 133. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq was a Khalif for how long? Two and a half years. Let's just say three years. 133 and three years is 136. Now the incident that I'm going to share with you took place in the 10 year of Hazrat Umar So 133 years have passed. Or let's say 136 years have passed. And this event takes place. Who recalls this event? Imam Tirmazi in Jami Tirmazi. The governor of Yemen, now Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, is the ruler of the Muslims. Islam is spreading through Persia, through Rome. Yemen is Muslim now. 
So the governor of Yemen wrote a letter to Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And he said, Ya Khalifa al-Muslimin, we had to uh, move the qabr of Abdullah bin Tamir. So everyone knew about the story. So the story was very, very popular. So we need to relocate the qabr, the grave of Abdullah bin Tamir. So when we dug it out, we found that Abdullah bin Tamir rahimahullah was sitting and his hand was on his temporal region, like this. And Tafsir Mazari makes mention he had a ring. And on that ring was Rabbi Allah. It was imprinted. Rabbi Allah. My Rabb is Allah. So one person, what he did is, he tried to remove the hand. Because they wanted him to lie down. So they wanted to remove the hand and flatten him in the grave. So when they removed the hand, he started to bleed. So this is 136 years after being buried. He started to bleed like it was a fresh body. Started to bleed. So they placed the hand on the temporal region once again. Then they wrote a letter to Azad Umar, what should we do? So Azad Umar ta'ala said, don't relocate. Leave it as it is. This is a miracle. Leave it as, as it is. Don't take the, uh, don't take the anguti. Don't take the, the fidwa, the, the khatam, the, the ring. Leave it as it is. So the Sahaba and the Tabi'een said, we left him as he was, in that sitting position, in that sitting position. And we, when we remove the hand from the temporal region, automatically when we used to release it, it used to go back to this position. It used to go back to this position. The position in which he gave his life to Allah Almighty. Now this was a miracle. Now... A few months ago, or let's say about, not a few months ago, about, maybe about two years ago, uh, there was a discussion in Brisbane uh, that the procedure of burial has been modified. So I'm trying to use my words properly. So the, the procedure of janazah has been modified. Burial, burial. So basically, early, early days, those that have been here for a long time, my noble brothers, they will understand that in the old days, we used to have concrete blocks. You have seen that, the concrete blocks. So we used to dig out the cover, and then we used to place concrete blocks. They were very, very firm, very, very strong. And then on the concrete blocks, we used to place the planks. And in between, the person used to be buried. Now the concrete blocks, right, they were very, very strong. You could stand on them, and if you just looked at them, from the outset you knew that they would not collapse. Later on what happened is, uh, whatever the reason was, I do not know, they introduced something else. So what they did is, uh, they removed the concrete blocks, right, and they... Uh, in the early days, the concrete blocks, let's say it was two or three. So the area in which the person was buried was very deep. So if he was to sit up, he could sit up. But nowadays it has changed. It's not strong as it was before. So the onlooker, when he looks at it, he will say that the time you throw the soil in and cover everything, most probably it has collapsed. Number one. And number two, the plank that is placed over, it does not give room to the deceased to even move. So you will only know what I'm talking about if you go to the Qabrastan and see. But I'm just sharing this with you. So a lot of people, they were very, very uncomfortable. They said, no, I shouldn't be like this. We should return it to the old style where the blocks are very, very firm and the room for the deceased is much more greater. But basically we have to understand that this is all material. And when a person is placed in alam barzakh the laws change. So it's basically a world in which the deceased finds himself that is very different than how we perceive it to be. So Abdullah bin Tamil was sitting there and he's sitting in that position. Now if you think about it, Makkah, Medina and Yemen. Makkah, Medina and Yemen. So it's very close. Even nowadays when we go to Jannatul Baqi or Jannatul Mu'alla and I've been to Jannatul Mu'alla when they're buried but I've been to Jannatul Baqi and most of you will um, relate to what I am saying. They dig out the graves according to the highest level of Sunnah and that is the Lahad. Lahad. Now Lahad is basically a grave. 
You know, if you can just, I'll try to depict it. It's a grave and they cut at the bottom. They cut at the bottom. And then they place the body inside. Basically, the body cannot move. So they made a room here. So when a person comes, he stand in here thinking that this is where the person has been buried. But the person is not buried there. The person is buried here. So there's a cut at the bottom. And they place the body inside and then they place a plank. Wood up here. Now, if this argument that the, the, the body cannot move is sound at any level, then the sunnah of lahad, that is the highest level of sunnah, doesn't make any sense. Because the body is not moving there. So basically we believe that when a person is buried in the qabr, and Munkar and Nakir come and then the people disperse, that room, according to his faith, may it be right or wrong, will squeeze or it will expand. So it's a different domain, it's a different theatre, it's, it's, it's a different realm. So if he has good Iman, it will expand. And if he does not have Iman, it doesn't matter how large it is. It can be the tomb of Pharaoh, how large it is, it will squeeze upon him. Does it make sense? Alright. Now, this was the story, alright, and this is the miracle. Now I want to make mention of something in relation to this. And the, these are the steps that we should remember. Now, if I pose a question to you, for the last three weeks we have been discussing this story and 70,000 people gave their life for what? I ask you, what did they give their life for? They were thrown into the fire. Why? Believing in Allah. That's it. That's why the child, the baby girl, said to the mother, Isbiri, inna ki al haq Mother, you make sabr, you are the truth. So basically... To uphold the right faith, they gave their life. True? Now I want you to remember the lesson that I'm sharing with you now. A human being has four valuable commodities. Every human being. All right. One is wealth. Number one. Number two is life. Number three is honor. And number four is faith. These are four valuable commodities that a person has. But one commodity may be more valuable than the other. For example, let's say a mobile and a drink. Now basically, this drink right now, in the state that it is, is not more valuable than my mobile. Because I can pick this up for $2, it is a good, it is valuable. But the value of this water cannot reach the value of this iPhone. Because the iPhone is, let's say, $1,000. With this thousand dollars, I can buy so many bottles of water. It's very, very simple. I'm talking about four bounties that Allah has bestowed upon us. One is our wealth. One is our life. Number three, our honor, dignity, izzat. And number four, our faith. But each has its own value. But there are some goods that are more valuable than others. So let, let, now I want you to remember the order. First, or from the bottom to the top. The first is wealth. Out of these four, wealth is the least valuable. Above wealth comes our life. And above life comes our honor. And above honor comes our faith. Now I'm going to give you examples. One person is sick. Let's say father is sick in the hospital. Mummy is sick at hospital. ICU. So the doctor says, look, this is a welfare state. Allah protect it. Allah allow it to blossom further. Let's say we are in a country that is not a welfare state. And you have to pay for your medicine, for treatment. So one person, he goes to the hospital. The doctor says, look, you have to spend one lakh rupees. Bring one injection, one lakh rupee. The person only has one lakh rupee. And the mother is on the deathbed. So on one side you have wealth. And on the other side you see life being taken. Will a person sacrifice the mother and hold on to the 100,000 rupees? Or will he give the 100,000 rupees and save the mother? Save the mother. He won't care about money. He will not care about money. He will spend as much as he can. So from this 
scenario that I have created, we can clearly understand that wealth is sacrificed for life. Life is greater than wealth. And people exploit this. People exploit this. You know, we are very, very fortunate. A lot of youngsters, they speak about uh, living in a Muslim country and most of the Muslim countries being corrupt. Most of the Muslims being corrupt. And this is a reality that we cannot deny. At these moments, they exploit everything. Exploit. There's a, there's a doctor that is in Perth. And I think I've shared this story many times before. Uh, he's an Irish person, a Scottish person, by birth. So when he speaks English, he's a Scottish but when he speaks Urdu or Punjabi, he's better than me. Beautiful Punjabi, beautiful Urdu, in the accent of Pakistan. So one day, uh, about 10 years ago, I led prayer at Holland Park Mosque. I said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And when I looked this side, there's one guy staring at me. So somebody stares at you once, that's okay. You look around and then you look again and you see him staring again. So that eye contact is made, then, then you break that eye contact, and then I looked the third time and he was still staring, and now he had a smile. So the first two times he's staring at me, and the third time he's smiling at me. I said, yeah, yeah, what is happening? So I went to him and I said, brother, who are you? And without saying anything, he kissed me and he hugged me. I said, I don't know this guy, he's kissing me and he's hugging me. And in that kiss, there was a lot of warmth. And he didn't kiss me here like I'm a bazook, he kissed me here like I'm a child. So this is when you kiss somebody that is elder than you and you respect. No, no, you don't respect. He's kissing up here like I'm a baby. And everyone is watching. And I feel embarrassed. And then he started to speak in Urdu. And he didn't look like he was from Pakistan. He said, I'm bullying you. He said, you've forgotten me. I said, I don't know who you are. What do you mean I've forgotten you? Then he spoke in English. And he had that accent. That Sean Connery accent. Beautiful accent. I said, I'm, I'm really confused. Please reveal yourself. Who are you? And he said, when in Raimund you were sick, I was your doctor. In Raimund, because I was very, very sick for five years. Uh, he said, I was your doctor. And I used to hold you. And I remember you were a skeleton. You were a skeleton. And I used to pick you up. So Hadiya al Wahab Sahib said, take care of this boy. He's come from uh, Balat, from England take care of him. And I was very, very sick. And my father was called for, and they said, take your son. And my father said, he can die. That's what my father said. I've given him for the path of Allah. He can die, he will be a shaheed, and this will be my ajr. That's my father. Allah reward him. So he said, I used to carry you. And you were a skeleton. You were a skeleton. And I carried you for five or six years, in and out, in and out. And now I see you like this. I said, how did you recognize me? He said, we're soulmates. So I recognized you, you were the guy. So why I'm telling you the story of this guy? He worked as a doctor. He was a doctor in Pakistan. I said, why did you leave? He said, I couldn't work there. I said, why couldn't you work there? He said, they used to exploit. He said, I used to work in a hospital. And the chemist used to be downstairs, the chemist. And the, the hospital was upstairs on Jail Road. Jail Road is in Lahore. Uh, the hos hospital is upstairs. So the person has died. He said, we knew that the person has died. And the doctor said, quickly, go downstairs, get these drips. Now those drips are $100,000, $200,000, rupees. Go and get these drips, he can be saved. The person has, has died already. Now the people do not know that he has died. The person will go there and downstairs they know because they're working together. They will give them drips of water. For one lakh rupee, two lakh rupees, drips of water. The person has died, they know he's dead. Then this person, he thinks that it's my mother, my father will be, you know, they will survive. And they take these drips upstairs and they will give these drips. This person said, this was all corruption, I couldn't work there. And he gave up and now he's in Perth. So what I'm trying to, the point that I'm trying to make is that life is greater than wealth. So people will give up all their wealth to save life. Now, so what was at the bottom of the ladder? Ladder? Wealth. What was above that? Jam. And that is uh, your, your wealth. What was above wealth? Honor. Life. And above life is honor. Many a times people give their life 
to protect their honor. Many a times we see that people will give their life to protect their honor. And that's why the Nabi of Allah said that if, uh, if a lady um, pushes people away to protect her honor, and in that struggle she gives her life, she dies, she's a shahida. So if one lady is being attacked and she's pushing the people and in that struggle of protecting her izzat and her honor, she dies, the Nabi of Allah says, she will stand with the shuhada, the martyrs on the day of judgment. So honor is greater than life. And that's why many a times it's stupidity. People will take life because of honor. It's happened in our countries. There's flirting, a lot of flirting. So this is an open society. Our societies in Muslim countries are not open. Alhamdulillah. But somebody is flirting and the family members come to know that there's a boy that is dating my daughter. What happens? Qatl al The family member of the girl will go and they will murder the boy and it goes on and on and on and on. So honor is greater than life. Why did the people of Mecca um, Bani Tamim, the tribe of Tamim, they used to bury girls alive. Why did they bury girls alive? Because of honor. Later on, they revealed that we were afraid that if this girl grows up to be a girl and we have to wed her, we will have to bow in front of a person, a boy, a man, and say, take our daughter. They were afraid of their honor. Their izza. So to uh, free themselves and exonerate themselves from that situation that will arrive maybe 19 years down the track, they used to kill the daughters. Now, of course, it is all wrong, but that's what they used to be. So honor is greater than life. Honor is greater than life. And what is on the top of the letter? Faith. This story. And many a times a person sacrifices his honor, but he never ever sacrifices his faith. For faith he will sacrifice his honor. And the very famous story, very famous story. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, he sent uh, a group of uh, sahaba and tabi'een towards Rome. Um, the king or the lord of that town, that Roman city, he had a very healthy discussion with the Sahabi. And he said, look, I am ready to accept Islam. I am ready to accept Islam, but you have to give me your word. He said, what word? He said, I will accept if Umar weds his daughter to me. Umar was Khalifa al Muslimi. If Umar weds his daughter to me, I am ready to accept Islam. The Sahabi said, look, I am not in the position to accept or reject. It's not my daughter, it's the daughter for Umar. So I can't say yes and I can't say no. So he returned back, so the person did not accept. When Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an heard the healthy discussion and the outcome of him, Hazrat Umar said, oh, is the izzat and the honor of Umar's daughter greater than the iman of a person? Is the izzat and the honor of Umar's daughter greater than the iman of that person? So basically, iman takes preference over Honor. And honor takes preference over life. And life takes preference over wealth. And this is the order. So these people, they were given the, they gave the ultimate sacrifice. And that is their own life. Now under this I would like to make mention, now this is 70 years before Nabi Akrim of Now I'm going to make a mention of another story and then that will close the chapter. And inshallah next week we will start the tafsir of Surah Al-Buruj. Hafiz ibn Hajar Asqalani in Al Isaba. Hafiz ibn Hajar Asqalani, one of the greatest, or I can say the greatest commentator of Sahih al Bukhari, Fatul al Bari. He makes mention in Al Isaba the story of Abdullah bin Huzafa Sahmi. And we're talking about Iman, the lesson of Surah Buruj, Iman. Nothing is greater than Iman. So Abdullah bin Huzafa Sahmi, radiallahu ta'ala, an. He was dispatched with a group of soldiers to fight against the Romans. So this expedition was traveling rapidly. 
but they hit a brick wall and they were caught out. So they became captives. Now the Romans, they had heard the stories about Sahaba. They knew about their valor. They knew about their, uh, their concrete and solid and firm iman. And somebody told the king that, do you know that amongst this group is a very well-known Sahabi, Abdullah bin Huzafa, Sahabi. He was the prankster. He was one of the pranksters amongst the ranks of the Sahaba, Abdullah bin Huzafa. And the Sahaba, not me, the Sahaba, his colleagues, they used to call him Himar, donkey. That's what they used to say, donkey to him. And they complained to the Nabi of Allah, Ya Rasulullah. So it wasn't a very dry environment. They used to be jolly. They went to the Nabi of Allah and said, This Abdullah bin Huzafa is always cracking jokes. He's a prankster and he makes us laugh. And the Nabi of Allah said, Leave him as he is. Allah and the Rasul love him. That's it. Leave him. Let him do this. That's why Allah has designed him. So he can make us laugh. All right. My observation, understanding in the community, the most muttaqi person is that person that never smiles. Another level of muttaqi. Another level of muttaqi, his head drops to the ground. What is this? This is no deen. Deen doesn't mean you can't smile. Deen doesn't mean that you can't enjoy life. The Nabi of Allah used to smile. The Sahaba used to smile. Inshallah, one day I will give you, maybe I will inject it in my tafsir, the beautiful jokes that used to take place in the noble court of the Nabi of Allah. And you can't stop laughing when you listen to these stories. So Abdullah bin Huzafa was one of the famous pranksters in the time of Nabi Akrim Muhammad So now they become captives. The king is informed that there's one person, he's very close to the Nabi of Allah, he's a very well-known Sahabi. So now the king wants to test the Iman of Abdullah bin Huzafa. He calls for him. And says, are you a Sahabi? He says, yes. Have you seen the Nabi of Allah? Yes. Now interrogation starts. Interview, interrogation. Now... So the king says, look, you know who I am. I'm very powerful. I have a lot of wealth. Yeah, my dominion is widespread. I'm ready to share half-half with you. And Abdullah bin Uzzafa said, what do I have to give in return? He said, you have to give up your faith. You have to give up your faith and I, give, I share half of what I have with you. Abdullah bin Uzzafa said, look, counter-proposal. My counter-proposal to you is, that if you give me all that you have and I become the leader of all Arabia and I have to give up my faith for one second, I will not even accept that proposal. You're only giving me half of your kingdom and half of your wealth. If you give me everything that belongs to you and I become the ruler of the Arab Peninsula and the proposal is that I have to give up faith for one second, I'm not even ready to do that. He said, I'm sure. He said, then be ready to be executed. He said, that's fine. So they tied him to the stem of a tree. And the king told the, uh, the archers not to strike him in the heart. But strike him at certain places where he will experience pain but still live. So they struck him on his foot. Struck him on his hands, on his palms. And they kept doing that. So they were striking arrows. So they were releasing arrows and these arrows were piercing into the palm, into the feet, maybe into the calf, into the shin. So he was bleeding profusely. Of course he's a human being. He must be screaming as well. I haven't read that in Isaba, but he must be screaming, my understanding. So when he was given the proposal again, all right, you have been through all this pain, the proposal still sits on the table, accept it. He said, I'm not ready to accept it. So they, when they knew that he was very, very steadfast, they said, undo the ropes, bring him to me. So he was brought to the king. The king said, that, does he have any other partners? They said, yes, said, bring those two partners. They were tabi'in, they weren't sahaba, so they brought them. There was a boiling pot of oil. And he said, I'm giving you a chance, one more opportunity to denounce. He said, I'm not going to denounce. So they picked up the two friends and threw them into the pot of burning oil. In a split moment, the flesh was separated from the bones and the bones disintegrated, finished. So they said, we're going to do this with you now. So they're just ready to throw him into the pot. 
And the king is sitting on his throne at a distance. And the messenger or the person that was close by, he came to the king and said that uh, Abdullah bin Husayn has started to cry. So it seems like all your tactics are starting to work. He has broken. So he didn't break when you proposed to him. He didn't break. Yeah? His courage did not break when you were piercing the arrows into his body. And he did not break when he found that his two Sati's friends were burnt in the oil. But now he's starting to cry because he have made the order to throw him into the oil. So they call Abdullah bin Huzafa the king. He said, I told you, you didn't have to go through all this pain. Now you have realized, I didn't want to do all this with you. I know now that you want to denounce your faith. He said, no, no, no. He said, why are you crying then? And Abdullah bin Huzafa said, I'm crying because I know my time is up. I believe my time is up. But I only have one life. And when this life is taken, I don't get another opportunity to show that I am ready to give another life. I would like this to happen with me repeatedly. Now the king was absolutely riveted, blown away. <laughs> Took a back step because they don't understand this. They don't understand this. How can a person say this? That he's not crying because he's afraid of death. He is crying because he only has one life to give. So now the king said, all right, I would like to release you. Kiss my hands. Kiss my hand. If you kiss my hand, I will release you. Because in those days, they used to respect Vela. They had the Izza for Vela. For bravery. And he said, such a great person. I can't punish him. I can't take his life. So kiss my hand. So Abdullah bin Huzafa, he thought in his mind. He said, look, what about my Sakis, my friends that are behind bars? I will not leave this city alone. I will leave with them or I will die with them. So the king said, all right, if you want them to leave with you, then you kiss my forehead. Now, I just told you a few moments ago, kissing the forehead is for honor, respect. So if you want to go, you kiss my hand, that's fine. But if you want to take your sakis with you, then you have to kiss my head. Now, Abdullah bin Huzafa, he stopped for a split moment and he started to think. Because kissing the head of the king is giving a izza to a non-believer. Especially an enemy of Allah. But something came in the mind of Abdullah bin Huzafa and he kissed the forehead of the king. And the king was true to his word. He released everyone. Before the army could arrive in Medina al Munawwara, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala was informed about the entire story and what Abdullah bin Huzafa opted for and what he did. And because of kissing the forehead of the king, everyone was released. So when Abdullah bin Huzafa radiallahu ta'ala entered the city, Hazrat Umar called for him. So he was brought in front of Hazrat Umar. So Hazrat Umar told all the people of Medina, come. He said, because of Abdullah bin Huzafa and his intelligence, so many people were saved. He kissed the forehead of a king, not because of the king. He kissed it because he wanted to save his people. So today, Umar, Khalifa al Muslimin, will kiss the forehead of Hazrat Abdullah bin Huzad. So he kissed the forehead. And all the Sahaba in Medina kissed, or the Tabin at that time, kissed the forehead of Abdullah bin Huzafa. Now, Hafiz ibn Hajar Askalani in Isaba, he makes mention of this story. And it is very, very well connected to the message of Surah Al Buruj that nothing takes preference over Iman. Iman is the gift and the commodity that is the most valuable for us. And we will not forsake it for anything. May it be wealth, we will sacrifice wealth. May it be jam, life, we will give up our life as well. And that's why in Surah Tawbah, verse 110, Surah number 9, verse 110, Inna Allah ashtara min al mu'minina. These are the first two steps of the letter. Allah says that I have bought from you your wealth and your life. In return, Allah will give you Jannah. And if we have to give up our izza and our honor, we will give up our izza and our honor. And that's what the, the prophets were. People, they had so much izza, so much honor. And people used to call them mad People used to call them, call them foolish. People used to spit on their face. People used to throw tripe upon them when they were in sajda. This is all attack on the honor of that person. But they were ready to endure all that because they knew that they were holding on faith. 
As long as you're holding on faith, whatever takes place around does not matter. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayka.